So the portion that I want to focus in on of, of our reading tonight from Matthew chapter 20 is right there at the beginning. Let's look down again, starting in the first verse, the, the verse, the Bible reads, For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. So we're getting a parable here about the kingdom of heaven. Right? About heaven. She said, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. There's a man that owns a vineyard, and he needs workers to work that vineyard. He's got some fruit that need to be reaped. There's some, some work that needs to be done in the vineyard. And he said, I need, I, I have this huge vineyard. I need workers, man. And he goes out and says here, verse number two, and when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way, and he went out about the sixth and ninth hour, and did likewise. So all throughout the day he's going out, he doesn't have enough laborers. He doesn't have enough people to go out into his vineyard, because he still keeps going out, and he sees people standing around, he's like, what are you doing here? I got work for you to do. And he goes on and on, and then in verse 6 he says, And about the eleventh hour... He went out and found others standing idle, and saith unto them, why stand ye here all the day idle? They say unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He saith unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. Now there's a, lot, uh, there's a lot of depth to this one parable. There's a lot we could learn from this. I think one primary application that, that we could use for this today is that God is looking for laborers to do his work. He wants people to go out into the harvest and reap. He wants souls to get saved. He wants us to go out and sow and to reap. He has work for us to do. And what I want to pay even more notice to is there in verse 6, which says, it's the 11th hour. So typically a work day consists of about 12 hours in the Bible when you look at you know, a, a, your average work day. He says it's the 11th hour. There's only one hour left to do work. And he goes out and he still see people standing around. Now, I believe in the, the whole scheme of things, we're in the 11th hour right now as far as where we're at in time in history with the coming of Jesus going to happen soon. I don't know. I don't claim to know exactly when it's going to happen, but I believe we're in the 11th hour. I don't think that we're going to go that many more years before Christ returns. You can see things happening. You can see the one world religion, the one world government being propped up and set up. I mean, we're not there just yet, but I, I mean, you see it happening. It's not going to be surprising to me if it happens within our life, within my lifetime or within my children's lifetime. You can see things happening and seem to be progressing faster and faster. We're in the 11th hour. And I think God's up in heaven going... <clears throat> Christian, believer, why are you idle? Why are you standing around? I mean, Christ is coming back soon. What are you doing not working for me? I've got this huge vineyard called the world. You need to go out there and do my work. And the, the title of my sermon this evening is, What Are You Waiting For? See, I'm hoping to do tonight, we're going to look at some scripture. I want you to get motivated. There's a lot of people in this room, specifically, that I think can do a lot more for the Lord. And myself included. We need to keep our priorities straight. What are you waiting for? There's a lot of things that people wait on. They don't want to do. Well, I'm not that comfortable yet. I don't know if I can give the gospel to somebody. Else. And it's like, there's all these excuses in the world of not to do something. What are you waiting for? There's a lot of work to be done. The Lord is looking for labor. Turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I believe this, and I know this to be true. It's not even just a belief. I know this for a fact to be true. There are many people in this very small congregation that we have that are very talented. God has gifted you with abilities. The Bible tells us this when, you know, when it talks about the church being comprised of its members. And every member has a different function, has a different role, different, different things that they're good at that God has given them a gift of doing. But I, I still don't feel like our body is functioning fully. I don't think we're up, we're up to our potential yet. We have a lot of members, and I love you all. Look, and, I, and this isn't meant to like, 
browbeat anybody, especially not anybody in particular. I, I want you to, to understand the spirit of the sermon and, and what I think God is seeing here. We're in the 11th hour. We need to be working harder than ever as that day approaches. I mean, that's why the Bible says that we need to be congregating, assembling ourselves together so much more, the more, so much the more as you see the day approaching. As the time, you know, as we see the wickedness coming on us and we see the end times just kind of getting closer and closer, we need to be congregating more. We need to be getting the preaching more and we need to be doing more for the Lord. I mean, things are ramping up. We, it, you know, it, it's getting time. It's go time. We need, to, we need to get our focus right. We need to, to, to shake off the distractions and all the cares of this world and, and get out and actually start rolling up our sleeves and doing some work. It's so easy to get sidetracked on the things of this world. It's so easy to get caught up in everything else and to throw out this excuse, I don't have any time. Every believer, first of all, my first point, should be a soul winner. If you're saved, and especially if you've been coming to our church or a church like this for any period of time, and you're not showing up to the soul winning times, what are you waiting for? What is it? Ask yourself, what are you waiting for? What is it that's holding you back from going out soul winning? 2 Corinthians chapter 6, look at verse number 1. We then as workers together with him... Talking about Jesus Christ. We're workers together with God. God, God has us hired as his workers. But we, we don't just go out and work by ourselves. We work with Christ. God gives us the Holy Ghost that that's what is the power comes from to even lead somebody to Christ. We are working together. We're getting in the yoke with Jesus Christ and doing this work with him. We then as workers together with him beseech you. This is the language that Paul's like, I beseech you. What do you mean? He said, basically, it's like, I'm begging you. I beseech you, please, also, that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. You've received grace from God. You've got that great gift of eternal life. Don't just, just put that gift up in the closet, close the door, and just live on with your life as if you didn't get it and not benefit anybody else. That would just be in vain. You say, great, you're saved, but what good does that do to anybody else? It's like James 2, and it says, you know, someone comes to you, they're naked, they're hungry, and you're just like, oh yeah, be warm and be filled. See ya. What good does that do that person? Nothing. What good does you being saved have for anybody else in the whole world when you're not willing to open up your mouth and be a worker together with God to go out and preach the gospel? Beseech you that you receive not the grace of God in vain. Verse number 2 for he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation, giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed, but in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God in much patience, in afflictions and necessities and distresses, and on and on. Think about this. Would you tell an unbeliever to wait before putting their, Christ, their, their trust in Christ? Yeah, just think about that for a while, you know, not a big deal, just whenever you get around to it again. Of course not. There's an urgency for people to get saved. Why? Because we don't know what's going to be on the morrow. You have no idea. And what the devil likes to do is when the seed is sown in someone's heart, the devil likes to come and snatch that away, as the parable of the sower tells us, which we're going to be turning that actually in a little bit. Satan doesn't want people to get saved right away. He wants them to fall into the trap of saying, well, I got to think about it. Well, I need some time. I don't know if I can make that kind of decision. When we go out as soul winners, the urgency is on. And people need to come. To, you know, now, look, not everyone's going to do it. Not everyone's going to receive Christ. You know, some people will want to wait. But that doesn't change our message. I always urge people, look, this is serious. Because it is serious. Otherwise, we wouldn't be out doing it. Hell's a real place. And until you know for sure that Christ is your Savior, you, know, you got to get this thing settled. Why would you wait on such a thing? The only reason why people would wait is because they don't really believe. I mean, otherwise, if you believe that hell was real, and you believe that you are headed there, what in the world are you waiting for? Why, why would you put that off? I mean, of all things in this life that you could think of, 
that, that you can put off for another time. If you really consciously was thinking about it and you thought, my soul is heading to hell. Well, you know, I'll just think about that. I'll deal with that next week when I got more time. You're not fully realizing the implications there. You're not realizing how real hell is. We do not tell people just, eh, well, whatever. It's urgent. It's important. Just as important as salvation is, putting your trust in Christ, is the things that God has laid out for us. I mean, maybe it's not quite, you know, it is as important because what God has for us to do is to tell other people how to get saved. So it's not necessarily as important for you as you, what your salvation was to you, but it's as important as someone else's salvation is to them. They're not going to get saved. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If nobody is being sent, nobody's going out and preaching the word. People need to have a preacher. How, how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? Romans chapter 10. It needs to happen. And look, this is a church where we're sending people out to do the work. We're sending you. You need to heed that call because it's not just me sending you. This isn't under my direction and authority that I'm specifically sending you. This is God sending you. I'm relaying the message that God has for you to fulfill this great commission where you need to go out according to God's orders, according to the will of the Lord, and preach the gospel to every creature. Get them baptized, get them in church, and, and get them learning everything that Christ commanded. That's the fulfillment of the great commission. We need to be doing this. This job is for every believer. Every believer. What are you waiting for? Philippians 4, 6, turn if you would to Luke 14. Some people say, well, I'm a little bit nervous, or, or I want to learn a little bit more, or I, I don't feel that confident, I don't feel that comfortable. Right? Well, it's not going to be that comfortable. Going out sewing is not comfortable. When I go to work every day, that's not, it's not comfort. I'm not going to a spa and relaxing and just enjoying the time. That's not Because I have a full-time job outside of my full-time job of pastoring, outside of my full-time job of being a dad. Okay, if you didn't know that. It's not something that's comfortable to just wake up early, get up, go to work, and, and just and work, and work all day. It's not comfortable to go out and, and preach the gospel to people. Yeah, you're going to be a little nervous. Yeah, you're going to need to study up a little bit, but the point is, though, and what, what I believe the Bible is teaching us is that don't just wait around. The, the woman at the well, I brought this up I, probably this morning, uh, when Jesus, you know, when she was speaking to Jesus, what's the first thing she did? She dropped her bucket, went into town, and started leading people to Christ. She didn't say, well, wait a minute, I got to go, you know, make sure I know all the answers, so if anybody tries to stump me, I got an answer for them. She didn't wait to do that first. Now, should we be doing that? Yes, we should be trying to do that in the meantime, but it doesn't mean put all the work on hold. Right? When, it, when any job that I've had, every, every job that I've had, they've all had training involved. Every single one of them. But not one of the jobs I've ever had had me just completely... And look, someone's going to say, I've had a job like this. Not one of the jobs that I've ever had had me just sit in a classroom and just never do any work and just learn. All of them were on the job training. Every single one. Now, some of them did have classroom portions where we're learning more things, but I was always working. There was always a trainer. There was always somebody involved to help teach you along the way. Why? Because you need to be productive. Nobody wants to invest in somebody to just pay money to somebody just to learn and not perform and not produce. What does that profit? Just to sit around. What is the profit for you just to sit around and read your Bible all day long and just read your Bible, read your Bible, read your Bible. Look, read your Bible. Is that a good thing? Amen and amen. We ought to be doing. We ought to be reading our Bible every day. What good is it going to do if all you do is read your Bible? You never go out and talk to people. You never go out and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. You never go out and share what God has shown you in the scripture. You just read the Bible all the time. It's like you're training and training and training and training and never getting to work. 
What good are you if you're the most skilled employee but you're not actually working? What value is that going to be? What are you waiting for? The Bible says in Philippians 4, 6, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Be careful for nothing. He's saying you don't need to be careful in these matters, especially you know, the things that God has for you. Just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they said, you know, um, unto, unto King Nebuchadnezzar, we're not careful to answer you. When he told him, look, you got to bow down before this idol or else you're going to be thrown into this burning, fiery furnace. And they're like, you know what? We don't need to stop and think about it. We don't need to check and, and, and double check and make sure what we're doing is right. So we know this is right. We're not careful in answering you. We're not going to do it. We're, we're not going to worship some false god. Not going to happen. They weren't careful, they didn't, they, which means that they didn't care about the consequences of the stand that they were going to take because it was the right stand. We need to not be careful when we are going to go out and do some work for the Lord in the sense that, hey, someone might get angry at you. Someone might slam the door in your face. Someone, you know, don't know. But God's telling us, you know, be careful for nothing. We don't, you don't, if you're doing the work of the Lord, you know, fear not their faces. Don't be dismayed at that. As we told Jeremiah, that's what he told Ezekiel. He's saying, you got, I've got a message for you to preach. It may not be well received. In fact, it's not going to be. He told them, he said, they're not going to listen to you. But you know what? This is what you have to preach anyways, because I'm telling you to do it. Don't get nervous and wondering. And now look, first of all, it's not that bad. And anyone who's been out soul winning knows it's not that bad. What we have a tendency to do is, is build up things in our mind way worse than it actually is. And I know this firsthand because I used to be the most fearful, not wanting to talk to anybody type of a person. Just like I thought it was insanity to walk up to a person's house that I have no idea who lives there and knock on their door and actually talk to them. I'm a computer programmer. That's not, that's not <laughs> in my nature to just, hi, how's it going? Not, you know, no, no, I, I'm, I've always been very small group of friends, not, you know, branching out and just doing, definitely didn't like being in the center of attention and it's like, now I got all eyes on me. But that's just what the power of God will do for you. This isn't, I'm not saying under my own skill. And when you go out soul winning, that's not, you, you know, your own power, really. God's the one that's going to help you through that and get, and get people saved anyways. But you need to be willing to be that worker to go forward and do the work. Now, you could improve your skills, and you ought to. You could learn more of the Bible and become better and a better, more skilled laborer for the Lord. Absolutely. But if you're not out doing it at all, you're never going to get better. And see, the thing is, you could spend all your time saying, well, I'm not ready yet. I'm not ready yet. I'm going to keep studying. I'm going to keep learning. When you go out, you're still going to screw up. You're still going to make mistakes. I don't care how long you practice and study beforehand. The first time you go out soul winning, you're going to do something wrong. <laughs> you're going to do something. You're going to, you're going to fumble around. You're going to be nervous. Whatever the case may be, you have to just get through it. You have to just, just, just say, you know what? I'm going to do this by faith. I see what the Bible says. I'm just going to go out and do it because it's the right thing to do. It's what God has for me. I'm not going to wait around anymore. I'm just going to go out and do it. You're in Luke 14. Look at verse number 5. Because another reason why people don't submit to the will of the Lord to go out and preach the gospel is not just because of nervousness or, or they don't maybe feel comfortable and they want to learn more. It's just because their priorities aren't right. They're not prioritizing the things that they ought to have first in their life. The Bible says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things should be added unto you. And that's in context talking about food and clothing. Now, are food and clothing pretty important? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you don't have food, you're going to starve. Right? If you don't have clothing, besides people laughing at you, you're going to be cold and not protected right from the, from the condition. These are things that we need. But God still says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Before your basic necessities, seek God first. That means priority number one goes to God. 
Number two goes to feeding and clothing yourself. That's what God expects of us. Luke 14, look at verse number 15. And one of them sat at meat with him. And one of them that sat at meat at him uh, heard these things. He said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto his servant, Go, go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. I'm going to pause here real quick. What we saw in the story before, you know, it's his parable. He's like it to him. God. He's saying, there's this great feast prepared. And all the, 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 the guests that were, that were invited originally, they're saying, well, yeah, I got other things to do, right? They have all these excuses. Well, I've got these oxen. Well, I got to prove my oxen. Well, I just got married. All, all these things are just coming up why they can't come to this meal that's been prepared for them. It makes the, the master, of the, you know, the guy that's, that's putting this on angry. Says, I mean, he's angry about it. He says, I'm doing all this for you, and you just, you're going to go off and do other stuff? He's angry. Now, I, I like, re I'm trying to read all this in context just so you understand. This isn't the primary application, you know, what I'm teaching on tonight, what I'm going to be reaching on, isn't the primary application of this parable. It's slightly different. Because this is about the people who are actually invited and compelling people to come in and, and partake in that supper. But think about God who has prepared things for you as a believer. He's prepared all this stuff, but he has work for you to do. And he wants you to come and do this, and he wants you to come and do that. And you just say, well, God, I know you want me to do this, but I've got something else coming up. Well, I've got this other thing. Well, I've got, I've got everything else going on in my life. God, I just, I don't have time. These other things are just taking priority. Do you think that's not going to make God mad? He's like, I gave you eternal life. We got mansions prepared for you up in heaven. I promise to provide your needs for you. I've already told you that. I will feed you. I will clothe you. Just listen to what I have to say. Well, I don't got time for that. I got other things going on. It's going to make God angry. We don't, we don't want to be on God's bad side. Now look, just because you're saved, you don't have to face hell. doesn't mean that you want to be having God coming down on you as a disobedient child either. But we're going to keep reading here. We, start, we started to get into this. I meant to pause a little bit to, to kind of go through a little bit on what we saw there in that parable. But Jesus is explaining now what it takes to be his disciple. This is important. I mean, hopefully you can see yourself. Are you someone that wants to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? Do you want to be a follower of Christ? Being a disciple is not the same as being a believer. Anyone can be a believer. But a disciple is something new. A disciple is someone who's going to do the work. A disciple is someone who's literally going to be following Jesus Christ. He says, if you want to be my disciple, it comes at a cost. We'll read verse 26 again. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also he cannot be my disciple. Why? Because Christ has to be first. Yourself, your family, your wife, your kids, they can't come before Jesus Christ. You have to be willing to say, Jesus, you're number one. Verse number 27, And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me, cannot be my disciple. Don't expect it to be easy. 
Don't think that you can get by being a disciple of Jesus Christ. Like, man, I'm a disciple of Christ. I would do whatever he asks for me, except unless when it's uncomfortable and I don't want to do it. Bearing a cross, it doesn't get much more uncomfortable than that. I mean, yes, this is speaking metaphorically, but literally, what did Jesus do? He carried the cross that he was going to be nailed to and put to death. That's where the metaphor comes from. From him carrying the instrument of his own torturous death. We need to be willing to bear our cross. And whatever your cross may be, it's not going to be anything as bad as what Jesus faced. Some of us have scary things that, that you're facing uh, that, that come as a result of your obedience to the Lord and doing His work. You're going to be faced with, with, with persecutions. You're going to be faced with things. Whatever it is that's going to come against you as your cross, you need to be willing to bear that. If you're going to be a disciple of Christ. Now, if you don't want to be a disciple of Christ, you just want to take your gift and just say, well, I'm saved and just not do anything for anybody. You could do that. you got free will. It, it's not going to, th this life isn't going to go well for you, though. If you think you're just going to take your gift and just live the comfortable life, God's going to make sure you're not comfortable anyways. You might as well be uncomfortable and serve God and rack up rewards for yourself in heaven because that's what he says he's going to do anyways. If you, if you work for him, he's going to pay you. Make that, that, that heavenly 401k plan as full as possible. Because if you want to just get by and just live a comfortable life here, you're not going to be comfortable. He'll make sure of that. He's going to make sure that, that oh, okay, that's what you want to do. And, and you're never going to be satisfied by not serving the Lord. Now, um, let's keep going here, though, about, about being his disciple. He explained this even further. Verse 28, For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first, and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Lest haply, after he hath laid the foundation, and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build, and was not able to finish. Or what king, going to war, going to make war against another king, sitteth not down first, and consulteth, whether he be able with ten thousand to meet him, that cometh against him with twenty thousand? Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. There's a high cost coming to serving Christ and being his disciple. That's what he's teaching us here. I mean, no one goes to war without figuring out, hey, how many guys do they have? How many guys do we have? What is the cost of this war? Is it, does it make more sense just to make a peace with them? as opposed to fighting this battle. Does it make more sense? Hey, we want to build this great tower. We're not going to start investing and just wasting a bunch of time and money and resources if we're not going to be able to finish this thing. If you're saying today, yes, I want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. I want to follow him. I want to have to do what he has for me. He's saying, here's the cost. You need to be willing to put up everything. You need to be willing to to deal with if your, your family forsakes you, anyone forsakes you for doing what's right, you need to be willing to say, I'm going to serve the Lord, whatever the cost may be. Verse number 34, Salt is good, but if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land nor yet for the dunghill, but men cast it out. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear now, I've spent the majority of the time to this point speaking about soul winning. What are you waiting for? If you haven't been soul winning, if you don't go regularly, what are you waiting for? What is it that's coming up? What is the reason that you don't go out, that you're not making a priority? Is it just the fact that it's not prioritized properly in your life? Everybody has a reason why they can't do it. You know what? I've got reasons why I can't be a pastor. But here I am. Why? Because of my priorities. I didn't have time to write sermons this week. I was up till four this morning writing sermons for today. Now, I'm not asking for sympathy and I'm not looking for glory. The point is to show you that as the Apostle Paul did, saying, and look, I'm not the Apostle Paul, but he's a great example that I could use. If he can do it, so can you. If I can do these things, 
so can you. I've got a family of four young children and one on the way. I've got a wife. I've got a full-time job that I have to work overtime at in order to make ends meet. I pass through this church and do all of these things. Why can't you go out soul winning at the soul winning time? Why can't you do, you know, whatever it is that God has for you? Why can't you do your Bible reading? Get in the Word every single day. Every day, read from the Bible. Why? Do you not have enough time? I managed to put in some, some time in the Bible. I managed to do some Bible memory, praying, right? All these things that God wants us to do on a regular basis. And I'm not somebody special by any means. I am not anybody special at all. I'm not Superman. I'm not someone who's just like way different than you and, and just can deal with more than you, whatever. What are your priorities though? And you say, well, you're the pastor. You're supposed to be doing this. Before I came the pastor, guess what? I did all the things I'm doing now except I wasn't preparing three sermons a week. <coughs> just as a church member. Why? It's just priorities. And again, look, I'm not trying to brag at all. What, what I'm trying to do is just, just let you know, if I can do it, so can you. There is no reason, there should be nothing holding you back from doing the things that you know you ought to be doing. Don't let excuses get in the way. I had a great man that, that was my role model and my example and Pastor Anderson. I still look at that guy and say, when does he ever sleep? Maybe he doesn't. I don't know. <laughs> he gets a lot more done than I do. I mean, he's putting out these films and doing all the soul winning and traveling to other countries and doing all this. It's like mind-blowing. But you know what? He's just a man. He's a man. So I look at that and say, you know what? Maybe I'm not being very efficient with my time. Maybe my priorities are screwed up somewhere else. I don't know. But if, if he can do it, why can't I do it? I can do it. He's just a man. The Apostle Paul could do it. You can do it. And I mean that. He's just a man. Look, we're not lifting people up on some pedestal that just like, <gasps> super holy Christian. You can do that too. Anybody can. Anybody can. But do you want to? Have you counted the cost? And is it worth it to you? Do you want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? And if you do, what are you waiting for? Turn, if you would, to James chapter 4. As I mentioned, the Bible reading. Have you ever even read the Bible one time from cover to cover? One time. If you haven't, what are you waiting for? Get in your Bible and read it. We've got charts on the back where you can mark off everything that you've done and keep track of it to make sure you've at least read the Bible one time. And don't stop at one time, but I mean, if you haven't done it one time, and this is what you claim your faith, your, your faith is founded in, is God's Word, what are you waiting for? Get to it. Bible memory, have you ever memorized even a verse? Now, I know we do long sections sometimes, we do chapters, but how about just one verse? Do you have any verses of the Bible committed to memory? The Bible says, you know, to, to hide His Word in your heart. This is something we ought to be doing. Maybe you memorize a verse, what about a chapter? What about a book? It's not crazy, people do it. Your prayer life. We have these prayer requests for a reason and, 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 you know, we need to be doing it on a regular basis and whether you use this or not, it doesn't matter. This is, this is for your benefit to help the people that are on this list, to help the people of this church and to help you to remember, hey, these are all the people I need to, rem to, to pray for and you can write in all your own too. But it's a way to help with organization so that you make sure you get it done. So you're not forgetting it. So you're not saying at the end of the day, well, I've done all this other work I did all my house chores, I went to, to my job, and I did everything else, and now I'm just too tired and I can't, I can't pray. Now I'm too tired and I can't do my Bible reading. Now I'm too tired and I can't go out soul winning. Now, you know, well, what are you putting first? Obviously, you're not putting God first if you, do, if you do everything else and then whatever is left over. Do you think God wants your leftovers? Is that who God is? Do you think He wants to say, well, you do everything you need to do, and you know what? Whatever is left over, just go ahead and give that to me. No, God's the God of the first fruits. God's the God that says, you know what? The first of your increase is mine. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, and these things shall be added unto you. The first. Put him first. If, you don't, if you're not willing to hate your father, your mother, your brother, your sister, your wife, your children, you can't even be my disciple. That's what Jesus said. 
Well, what about baptism? Maybe you're saved and you've never been baptized. You know it's right. You know it's something you need to do. What are you waiting for? There should be no reason to wait for baptism. Once you get saved, you should be ready to go. There's all kinds of different things. You're in James chapter 4. Look at verse number 13. James 4, verse 13. Go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. What is your life? Ask yourself that question. What is my life? What does it consist of? What do I care about? What's important to me? The things that you do will show you what's important to you. Where does Christ fall on that list? If you write down everything you do on a daily basis, how much of that has anything at all to do with Christ? Ask yourself that question. And then you could tell yourself, what is your life? Now, the Bible is telling us here, what is your life? It's a vapor. I mean, we're here for a very short period of time. And I know this, that the older that I get, the faster and faster and faster and faster and faster time seems to go. Decades start going by in, in the blink of an eye. When you're younger, it doesn't feel that way. But, but the older I get, this becomes more and more and more of a reality. It's just like, man, I just need more hours in the day. There's so much I want to accomplish. There's so much I want to get done. I am already regret all the time I've wasted in my life up to this point. Say, man, if I was just doing more for God, I'd be so much more advanced at this point. Instead of just wasting all that time in my youth. Your time is valuable, but it's short. That's why it's valuable, because it's so short here. Don't waste it on the stupid little things. Do something important with your life. And what he's saying here is, is, you know, these people in James chapter 4, verse 13, is saying they're bragging about what they're going to do in the future, what they haven't even done yet. Say, yeah, you know, we're going to go here. We're going to make all this profit. We're going to do all this stuff. It's going to be great. We're going to do all these great things. And they're bragging about it already. They haven't even done it. Verse 15, for that ye ought to say, if the Lord will... We shall live and do this or that. You don't know what a day is going to bring. Don't be bragging about things you're going to do next year. Saying, you know what? I know I'm not soul winning now, but I'm going to read the Bible that much more. And then next year, I'm telling you what, then I'm really going to be on fire and do something for God. You don't even know if you're going to be here next year. You don't know. So don't brag about that. He says, but now you rejoice in your boastings. Verse 16, all such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. When you know, when you know God's will, when you know this is right, this is what God wants you to do, but you decide not to do it, you say, well, I know God wants me to do this, but I'm not going to do it. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what the reason is. We just come up with some excuse because everyone's going to have an excuse and they're going to feel justified. When you know that you're supposed to do right and you don't do it, it's a sin. Keep that in mind. Because look, look, as people and as Christians especially, like I know, we all want to think that we don't really sin. I mean, we'll, we'll give lip service to it. Yeah, yeah, I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm not perfect and everything else. But at the end of the day, you're not really thinking like, right. specifically on what am I sinning? Right. You know, where, where, where do I actually sin? Yeah, in theory, I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm not perfect. I don't claim to be perfect. But where is your sin? Do you know that you're supposed to be doing good? Do you know you're supposed to be preaching the gospel? I mean, do you even get the, the, the urge of the Holy Ghost when you see someone, hey, I need to give that person the gospel? I've had it many times. Some people say, I've never felt that before. You need to get out and, and start doing some work for God then because you ought to be getting that prompting. Yeah. To know to do good and not do it is a sin. Just as much as it's a sin to, to commit, you know, break one of the Ten Commandments. To lie, to steal, to covet, to commit adultery. It's not good enough. It's not good enough for God just to not do some of the wicked things. He also has work for you to do. We need to be workers and laborers. He says, look, it's the 11th hour. If at any time people need to hear the gospel, it's now. Why are you standing around? Why are you idle? And look, in God's eyes, it doesn't matter what you say. Well, I'm not idle. I'm doing this. I'm doing this. If you're not doing any work for God, you're idle. 
I mean, that's a fact. That's, that's, there's an urgency in the work that God has called us to do. Our spiritual life is so much more important than any other tasks that you have that you feel comfortable, you know, blowing off. Turn go to Mark chapter 4, last place we'll turn. Mark chapter 4. I told you we we're going to get to the, to the parable of the sower. Because I want you to analyze your life. Hopefully everyone here is familiar with, this, with the parable of the sower. Right, a sower goes forth to sow seed. Some of it uh, falls by the wayside. Some of it falls by the stony ground. Some of it falls among the, the, the tares and the wheat. And then some of it falls on good ground. Right? There's, there's the different examples of, of where the, the seed falls and what ends up being produced as a result. I think as you read the parable of the sower, I bet everyone thinks, yeah, I'm the seed planted in the good ground. Right? I mean, it, that's probably your self-perception of, of course, of course I'm the seed planted in the good ground. Right? I mean, that's the best one. You're the one that's producing. It's like, yeah, that's me. Look at verse number 18. Mark 4, verse 18. We're not going to read the entire parable. Look at verse 18. And these are they which are sown among thorns, and such as hear the word. And the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. All these various distractions, all these other things, all these other priorities, all these other obligations, all these other things you get yourself busy with, the lust of the world, making money, whatever, whatever it is, causes it to become unfruitful, that plant. And the measure of fruit, and I'm not going to get into this very in depth, very simple. Fruit is a, a, a product of the source of the tree, right? Apple trees produce apples. That is the fruit. Orange trees produce oranges. What is the fruit of a Christian? Other Christians. A Christian tree, right? Someone who actually goes out trying to produce fruit. Because not every, not every believer is producing fruit. I mean, we know that even from this parable because the only one that's not saved is the one where Satan came away and, and took the, the word out of their heart. The rest of these examples in this parable of the sower, they received the seed. It says that they received the seed with gladness. What does it take to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Receive that seed. You get saved. But not everybody is producing fruit. Everyone wants to think, yeah, I'm sowing on the good ground. I'm bringing forth all this fruit. Bringing forth fruit is bringing forth converts. Where are your converts? Are you really the seed that's sown on the good ground or is your time just so caught up in everything else you don't have time to bring converts to Christ? If that's the case, you're really the seed that's sown among the thorns because you're hearing the word but then the cares of this world, other things going on have caused you to become unfruitful. You're not bringing forth fruit to Christ. You're not in his laborer gathering in the fruit. You're not, you're not in his vineyard. You're not a laborer in his vineyard gathering forth fruit. So jump down to verse 21, Mark 4. And he said unto them, Is a candle brought to be put under a bushel or under a bed, and not to be set on a candlestick? For there is nothing hid which shall not be manifested, neither was anything kept secret, but that it should come abroad. We've got the light of the, of the glorious gospel of Christ. We've got that great light. We ought to make that light to shine. And, and that's the whole purpose of it, is to let others know. That is, you you want to know what the purpose is? You're struggling with the purpose of your life. You're struggling with depression. You're struggling with other things. Tell other people about Christ. I mean, that's the best thing that you can do for anyone else. When you have your focus on other people, you stop focusing on yourself when you could bring such a great message to someone else and they receive that, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like it. It is, it is so important. It is so critical. God wants us to be, he's calling for laborers. He's always looking for laborers. Look, there's never enough laborers. The field is huge in this world. And there are so many believers that are not laborers. Let it not be said of Word of Truth Baptist Church that we are lacking in the laborer department. 
And again, I'm not trying to big on anyone in particular. I, I didn't have some particular person in mind when, you know, when I came up with this sermon. I hope that God's word will stir up your soul and stir up your spirit to do more for him because we can do more. As soon as you think I'm doing as much as I possibly can, you're going to start backsliding. Believe it. You, 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 got, you got to always be pressing forward and, and, and moving and trying to do more and working with things. What more can I do? And if you want to get more involved with this church, because there's, look, there's a lot more. I, I, I just preached on the basics. Believe it or not, this is all just the basics. Soul winning, reading your Bible, praying. Look, these are basics. Every believer should be doing these things. Do you want to excel and do even more? Talk to me after the service because I've got a lot of things in mind of more work and ministry that we could be doing here. I've got visions of lots of work that I want to be doing for God, but I can't do it all by myself and we need more people to do work and to labor. Let's be as productive as we can for God. Do you want to be a disciple of Christ for tonight? Be willing, be willing to pay the price. Spire Rise, I have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words, dear God. I pray that you would please help us to be stirred up. Help us to, to love others enough to, to want to do more for them, dear God, and not be focused so much on ourselves. Lord, help us to reprioritize our life and to get it in line with, with the things that you have for us to do first. Dear God, we know, we know that, that food and clothing and these things are important, dear God, but we also know that you've, you've promised to provide it for us. Help us have the faith in what you've said. With just as much faith as we trust in Christ to save us, dear Lord, help us have the faith in everything that you've said and all of your promises that we don't have to be so worried about where our next meal is going to come from, but we could be more worried about just, hey, am I doing what, what you have for me to do today? Because if I'm doing that, then I don't have to worry so much about the, about the food and the clothing because you've, you've told us that you'll take care of that. And I believe that, dear Lord. Pray that you please help us all to, to have our, our souls stirred this evening. And not just this evening, God, help us to go home and really analyze and think and not just be forgetful hearers. Help us all to be doers of the work, not just to leave and say, oh, well, that was a great sermon. Oh, I feel convicted, but then just have nothing comes of it. Lord, help us to push ourselves to do even more, to be more productive for you and to, to go out and gather more laborers. Lord, help us to, to not just bear fruit, but to bring, bring forth more laborers. We're in need. It's the 11th hour, God, to help us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.